My name is Charlie Reardon, provost uh, here at Hofstra University. And as we part way through day three, I just have to t stand up here and take a brief moment of uh, tremendous pride in our institution. And the last several days have just been remarkable conversations, uh, wide ranging discussions from all points of view, which we certainly welcome and celebrate. And a special congratulations and shout out to um, each of our panelists, many of them have been here for multiple days and have been very gracious uh, with their time, not only on the panels, um, but with our students. And so as I turn uh, the podium over for this plenary panel, I do want to mention our students or a subset of them in one important way. Um, those of us that had the pleasure of being in this room earlier this morning got to see four of our students who are members of the speech and debate team and they had a, a very lively, uh, compelling conversation about the Affordable Care Act led by uh, their new leader, Professor Trent Webb. So we're so thrilled Professor Webb has joined Hofstra. Um, the team came back from winning several awards at a national competition in uh, Peoria, Illinois at Bradley University. So we're, we're thrilled for that. And as I mentioned during that session, during the Q&A, um, I think our speech and debate team set the bar very high for this panel. Uh, be that as it may, I'm confident that this panel is up to that task. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Rosanna Parati, who is the professor of political science and the moderator of this panel. I want to thank you for coming to Hofstra. I want to thank our panelists. We have a great deal to discuss, so I'll get straight to introducing who we have here. Uh, Nancy Ann DePearl is a partner and co-founder of Consonance Capital Partners, over on, the, on your right, a private equity firm that focuses on investing in the U.S. healthcare industry. She's a director of CVS Health and HCA, in addition to Consonance Portfolio Companies and Clara Pharmacia, Turnkey Health, and Psychiatric Medicare Care. From 2011 to January 2013, she was assistant to the president and deputy chief of staff for policy in the Obama White House. She's a health policy expert and she served as counselor to the president and director of the White House Office of Health Reform from 2009 to 2011. And in that role, she spearheaded President Obama's successful effort to enact the Affordable Care Act and managed the initial implementation of the law. After leaving the White House, DePaul was a lecturer in law at Harvard Law School and a visiting scholar in economic studies at the Brookings Institution. We also have with us Kate Leone, right next to her, uh, who served as senior vice president of Governor, government relations with the nonprofit Feeding America, overseeing public policy, government relations, and advocacy teams. Prior to joining Feeding America, she served as general counsel for U.S. Senator Jean Shaheen of New Hampshire. Before that, she spent 12 years as the chief counsel to Harry Reid, the Senate Democratic leader. During her time with the senator, Kate served as the lead staffer on health reform and the Affordable Care Act. She played an instrumental role in shaping and passing that legislation in the Senate, as well as the Children's Health Insurance Program Reauthorization Act, the Food and Drug Administration Amendments Act, and the FDA Safety and Innovations Act. Ms. Leone also served as counsel to the previous, the previous Senate Democratic leader, Tom Daschle of South Dakota. And she worked as a senior policy advisor on the Senate Democratic Policy Committee. Dr. Wendell Primus was the senior policy advisor on health and budget issues to Speaker Nancy Pelosi for 18 years. In that capacity, he was the lead House staffer in developing the Affordable Care Act. He also played a major role in the Medicare sustainable growth rate legislation in 2015 and in various budget agreements. The drug pricing legislation that was part of the Inflation Reduction Act was his proudest staff accomplishment. He also worked closely with Representative Karen Bass on the Families First Child Welfare Act. Prior to this appointment in March 2005, Dr. Primus was the Minority Staff Director at the Joint Economic Committee for two years. 
He was also director of income security at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, where much of his work was centered on unemployment insurance. And next we have, and last, we have Phil Shalero. Uh, he worked in Congress and the executive branch for more than 30 years. He served as President Obama's Director of Legislative Affairs from 2009 to 2010. Special Advisor to the President in 2011 and the President's Advisor for the Affordable Care Act and Health Policy in 2013 and 2014. In Congress, his positions included Chief of Staff to Representative Henry Waxman, Democratic Staff Director of the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee, Policy Director for Senate Majority Leader Tom Daschle, and Staff Director for the Senate Democratic Leadership Committees. He is the co-founder of a nonprofit, Co-Equal, and a Senior Presidential Fellow for Hofstra University's Calico Center for the Study of the American Presidency. Um, these are brief bios. Their actual bios are much longer, but we're eager to get to the substance, and I welcome them all here. So what we'll be doing today is talking about the path that this legislation took and the, and the genesis of this legislation, and then we'll take it through that process and into more um, uh, implementation questions and perhaps even up to the minute. Um, I want to start with a question about the 2008 election. Um, and I'll direct this first to Dr. Primus. How did the Obama campaign and the House and the Senate address health care reform in 2008 as the campaign was just uh, moving forward? Um. I would say in, in, in several ways. One, there was a recognition that Obama and the Obama administration was not going to repeat the mistakes of the Clinton administration. In fact, I think there was a memo written basically saying, um, we're not going to do have a detailed administrative plan that was took months in the Clinton administration to put together. We are not doing that. We're going to come up with some principles and we're going to get buy-in from the Congress in terms of writing, um, writing that. And then another th key thing that kind of took place on the House side was um, Henry Waxman was elected as chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee as opposed to Mr. Dingell. Now, both of them were kind of in the same place on health insurance. Uh, they were quite different. I mean, John Dingell represented Detroit. Um, Henry Waxman represented um, California, and so they're quite different on climate uh, issues. But those are some of the key things, I think, um, that guided us. And, and we were starting to think about how we were actually going to write um, the Affordable Care Act, because we knew it was coming. Ms. Leon. So similarly in the Senate, discussions were underway, I'm sure. Most of you know Ted Kennedy's sort of lifelong goal as a legislator was to pass health reform, and he was the chair of the Health, Education, and Labor, Labor and Pensions Committee, and the other committee, the Senate Finance Committee, was led by Senator Baucus, who um, had a strong interest in pursuing health reform and had convened a summit and put out a white paper in 2008 about the importance of health reform. And so we started pretty early on working with the Obama campaign and then the transition. And to mention someone who's not here, who was already on board with um, soon to be President Obama, Gene Lambrew, who was with him throughout his entire time in the administration, was there to sort of help spearhead where they wanted to go with us as staff and talk us through the key pieces and get us thinking about health reform so that we were ready to put some pieces of uh, some of the building blocks in place even as early as the um, ARRA, the ARA, the Recovery Act, which we did right out of the gate with that administration. So that was really <coughs> critical, that early work um, that she put in and helped us, help guide us um, to where President Obama wanted to go. <coughs> um, Shalira? I want to say at the outset thank you for this, but also for the audience. It's been 13 years since the Affordable Care Act uh, passed, and this is the first time there's been a public panel with the lead staffer on the Senate 
the lead staff person in the House and then two people from the White House talking about how this happened, um, how the Affordable Care Act came to be. So um, for me, it's a, this is a special panel uh, for that reason. <coughs> when I think of 2008 and the campaign, um, I really don't want to say much because Valerie Jarrett is here and she was with the campaign the whole time, so she's more expert than I am, and I don't want to say anything wrong, but this was a priority for President Obama when he was running in 2008. And there was a lot of work being put in on what his plan would look like. Um, behind us is a screen that says hope and change. And, and what happened is the way the world looked in June was a lot different than the way the world looked in November because the entire economy collapsed. So uh, that wasn't the case in June. And hope and change um, potentially could have run into the hard reality of losing 600,000 jobs a month, which was happening in November, December, January of 2008 and 2009. Um, as a result of that, as the president got elected in, in early November, and we sat and looked at what would have to get done in the first few months of 2009, it included getting Congress to approve $350 billion in TARP money, which was very unpopular at the time, but it's something that the economists in the Bush and Obama uh, teams thought were very important to do. The president was gonna have to do an $800 billion stimulus. There was a trillion dollars from the previous administration that hadn't been um, passed by Congress in terms of appropriations for the country. The president was gonna to have to propose a trillion dollar budget, and he was gonna to have to do a hundred billion dollar war supplemental. So I don't know if we have any math uh, <laughs> folks here, but it's a trillion, a trillion, a hundred billion, 800 billion, 350 billion. Those were not options. That wasn't optional for the president. That was mandatory he was gonna to have to do to keep the country going. And by the way, he inherited two wars. So when I looked at it, I go back and think I was gonna be the incoming head of legislative affairs, what the president was facing. And this is exactly hope and change. He inherited two wars. That's a once in a generation challenge. He had a healthcare system that was broken. That's a one in a generation challenge. Climate was an existential issue, which is a once in a generation challenge. And the economy was collapsing. So he faced all four once in a generation challenges all at once and ver some very smart people said to him, you might wanna forget about the hope and change part. You know, we, why don't we just focus on the economy? And the president was adamant he wasn't gonna do that. He was adamant he wanted to try to do climate change. He was adamant he wanted to do the Affordable Care Act and he was adamant he wanted to do things like the Lilly Ledbetter bill and, and others that I'll go through later in the panel. So I, one of the things that I'm happiest about when I look back on those years is that the Affordable Care Act and other priorities didn't get lost. Hope and change didn't get lost. He was able to rescue the economy, but not just say, okay, we rescued the economy, we're gonna sit tight. Mm -hmm. He went on and did the other things. Well, let's take it up with the White House then. When he comes to the White House, the whole process of developing and adopting the Affordable Care Act was long, it was very precarious. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how involved the president was? Tell us a little bit about that, how that process began, where there are lines the administration wouldn't cross, or there are provisions that wouldn't have been uh, accepted. Um, and let me start with um, Mr. Parle, and then I'm gonna come back uh, to Mr. Shalira. Sure, thank you. Um, I would say there were three main principles to this approach from the, from the president's perspective. Um, first was the people, and as Kate and Wendell and Phil have described, there were a group of people who, who worked together, um, many of whom had worked on the previous Clinton bill that was a, was a failure, who didn't wanna have that happen again. I remember my conversation with Rahm Emanuel, who was there at the time, and we made a pinky promise that we weren't going to let this president fail. Um, Secondly, uh, the process, and there's a quote from LBJ, President Lyndon Johnson, that uh, he, something he said in 1964 that I typed out and put above my 
uh, computer monitor when I showed up at the White House. I showed up in March of 2009 after uh, the president had made the decision he was going forward with health care, and it was like jumping on a moving locomotive. I mean, it was, it was moving. Um, and what President Johnson said was there is but one way for a president uh, to work with Congress, and that is continuously, incessantly, and without interruption. And that is what President Barack Obama did and what all of us did, working together. Um, and that process uh, started with us setting forth principles, uh, the things that he had worked through, and we in the White House and Valerie was in all of these meetings, talked with him about what he was trying to achieve. And he made clear to me from my first meeting with him that it wasn't just about covering people, that yes, that was important. He saw that as important to strengthening our economy, uh, that our government was being bankrupted by health care costs, and that we had to slow down the rate of health care cost growth. So that was a key component of it, getting people covered by reforming the insurance markets and also strengthening care. He didn't want to just put everyone into the, the same system. He wanted to create new incentives for better care, better results, focus on the results, not just providing the sort of fee-for-service medicine. So this was not going to be easy, but those were the, that was part of the process, was getting Congress to draft that bill, meeting the president's principles and working together on it. And we also had um, daily, multiple times daily, calls and meetings amongst the White House and the, the House and the Senate. And the president himself did... Um, hundreds of meetings. I did hundreds of meetings. When, when the archives are opened, you will see his schedule. Um, you will see how many meetings he did every day with members of Congress, Republicans and Democrats, um, uh, trying to get this done. So it was very much an effort of, of you know, doing everything. And the third, the third um, P to my three Ps is priority. There was never any doubt once the president had made the decision that he wanted to try to get this done, to strengthen our economy, to strengthen our country, there was never any doubt in the White House from the top down that that was a priority. And uh, Valerie will, I, I'm sure, talk about this tonight, but um, everyone um, made sacrifices in order to make sure we were able to, to get that done. The president made sacrifices, all of us did. So I'd say those were the three reasons, the three things we did in our approach. Phil, do you want to address that? Sure. Um, to me, this is one of the most exciting things about public policy. President comes in, you're trying to figure out an agenda. And this is more than three-dimensional chess because the president, again, wanted to rescue the economy, as anybody would, stop the stem of losing 600, 700,000 jobs a month. TARP, um, president worked, went up to the Senate Democratic Caucus the week before he was inaugurated to say, we have to do this, even though nobody wanted to do it, got them to go ahead and authorize the second tranche of TARP. Then we were moving ahead on the stimulus, and we were just getting into the White House at the time. Believe it or not, this answers your question. Um, and we were just getting, you know, everybody's new to the White House. The, the, the thing I would hope everybody understands is that the White House and the executive branch, the White House particularly, is different than any other entity in the United States. There isn't a Monday that happens in January where everybody that works at Google leaves and a new staff comes in at Google, right? New CEO, new vice presidents, new everything. That doesn't happen at General Motors. It happens at the White House. One day, there's a regime there, and the next day, a whole new people group of people come in. And in our case, we had to come in at the same time we were trying to pass the biggest stimulus bill um, in history. So about two weeks after we were in, the president, Rahm Emanuel, and I were flying down to a Democratic retreat in Williamsburg, and we were still in the fight on stimulus. And uh, the president said, OK, we do this next one. We need somebody who can be in the White House who's just focused on this issue. That's what they're going to do. And the unanimous agreement was Nancy Andrew Pearl was going to be that person who could come in. Personnel is policy. Personnel makes the difference between being able to succeed and not succeed. And having Nancy Ann come in was a key part of Congress then being able to work effectively, the White House being able to work effectively with the House and Senate. Two other things I just want to mention that the president did. I had been in Washington for 25 years by the time the president was elected, and I had seen 
administration after administration come in and fail with Congress. And there was, there was a tendency for administrations to come in and say the people in Congress don't know anything. And with about a month, the people in Congress are saying, forget those people, even if they're of our party, they don't know anything. The president was very clear in the very beginning, let's recognize and, and make the best use we can of the expertise and experience in Congress. Ted Kennedy's been doing this for 40 years. Henry Waxman has been doing this for 35 years. The staff's up there, like Wendell had been up there for 25, 30 years. Kate had been up there for 20 years. There are other staffs who are up there for 30 years. But let's make, he didn't want to duplicate and diminish their work. It was additive. I'd never seen a president do that before. So we're going to add to the expertise that's there. The president himself was going to do this. Nancy Ann said, when the records come out, you will not just see him in meeting after meeting with members of Congress. You'll see him meeting after meeting on the substance of, of health care policy, House bill, Senate bill, what he thought should happen. The second thing he did, which I thought was brilliant, there's a, um, there's a phrase in Washington, if you're not pitching, you're catching. So if the administration's not coming in and it's clear that they're pitching to Congress, then Congress is pitching to the administration. The president didn't want that. He wanted it to look like a cooperative effort, that he wasn't dictating to them. They weren't dictating to them, doing it together. That's a very hard thing for reporters to get because somebody has to be winning, somebody has to be losing. His decision was very effective in getting things done. That's why the first two years were so successful. But he paid a price for that in terms of reporting because the lazy reporting of that is, well, he's not leading, he's not out front. To the extent he was more out front, I don't think we would have gotten as much done as we did. In the House, so the House and Senate are working on their versions of this uh, bill. Uh, the work starts in the House. Speaker Pelosi um, begins to build a Democratic coalition to pass the health care legislation. How did that, how did she go about that, um, Wendell? Um, and what were some of the decisions in the make policy making process? Um, you know, including the selection of committees and committee chairs and, and bill creation. Can you lead, walk us through that a little bit? Well, <clears throat> the first really key decision, uh, and she made it in, in concert with uh, Henry Waxman, Charlie Rangel from um, Manhattan, and uh, George Miller from the Education and Labor Committee. There were going to be three committees involved, but they were going to write one bill. And um, so once that decision was made, um, the staffs of those three committees got together and had endless uh, meetings and working with CBO, who played a very key role uh, in all of this, and they drafted um, the legislation. Um, and they first introduced, uh, again, this one bill in June of 2009, and then we had endless meetings with all of our various caucuses where the chairman would have to explain what was in the bill and why it worked, why it was the right thing uh, to do. And then uh, we've got um, a lot of pushback um, because, the, the, again, the principles were laid out by the president and they involved, it was gonna be based on private insurance, it was gonna involve a mandate, we were gonna expand Medicaid. Uh, and we have one complicated health system. I mean, we have, Medicaid, we have Medicare, we have veterans, we have employer insurance, and then we have this thing called the individual market where a lot of the junk plans and terrible plans are. Uh, and so there were tons of details that had to be worked out. And one of them was, um, I remember being in a debate like this with a Republican staffer to undergraduates, and I asked a simple question, and I bet this would also be true of your Hofstra, uh, 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 undergrads, you know, how many of you have insurance because you're on your parents' plan? And every hand shot up because that's how, and, and at that time, one of the largest uninsured places was 18 to 24 year olds. So that simple provision really guarantees that college students uh, have health insurance. So there is, and the other thing you ought to understand is that the House and Senate bill were very different. We had a simple revenue, a, a surtax on millionaires. 
We did not have a, a tax on high cost plans. We did not have this thing called uh, IPAB, uh, Individual Payment Advisory Board. Um, we had. You can uh, tell Wendell doesn't think very highly of that. <laughs> uh, I don't think very highly of it uh, because it takes away congressional uh, authority and mandates, et cetera. So my, my, the point is that we, we, we had to uh, construct, again, it was going to be um, state uh, based purchasing a change, is going to be the mandate, but the House and Senate bills were very different. And there were two issues that really, um, I think, came um, to blows. Because I remember in one caucus, Betty McCollum from Minnesota says, what is Minnesota getting out of this? We already have an expanded Medicaid program. You know, Medicare is a universal program, but in Minnesota and Iowa and Wisconsin, they spend about 70% of the mean. In Miami and McAllen, Texas, they spend 130%. So even though you have a uniform program, the spending was way different. And so regionalization, um, you know, you had Medicaid um, uh, eligibility levels at 25, 30% in some southern states. In the northern states, the blue states where the votes had to come from, uh, Medicaid was well expanded. Most of the children were already covered. We covered pregnant women. Uh, in, in the Medicaid program. So there was just a thousand and one details that had to go into drafting this 900-page um, bill, and then once in a while, the administration would throw us a curveball by saying, oh, we're going to cut a deal with the drug companies. Uh, and it was probably a good thing that they did, but Henry Waxman and Nancy Pelosi said that deal really wasn't good enough. So, you know, there were certain tensions along the way but um, at the end, the very night in, um, again, I'll shorten all of this, we had the last issue that got resolved was the abortion issue. There was a long meeting with representatives of the Catholic bishops. And I think only Nancy Pelosi uh, could have struck this deal because at that time we had about 30 or 40 pro-life Democrats and we needed a good chunk of those And Bart Stupak from the peninsula of Michigan was leading that group, and he, she allowed an amendment to be brought on the floor so we could get a lot of those pro-life Democrats agreeing to, and it was a complicated procedure where on the exchange you had to have some plans that didn't offer abortion coverage and some that did. And the truth was, insurance companies, if you had abortion, they were lower premiums than if you had, uh, didn't have abortion coverage. So. Again, I'm trying to give you some flavor of all of this, but it was, uh, and then um, we had a, Nancy Pelosi had an easier job than Harry Reid because we could lose about 35 or 40 Democrats, whereas uh, Harry Reid couldn't lose a single one of his 60 Democrats at that time, and then you got uh, the Cornhusker deal and certain things. I mean, I guarantee you that Fox News never said look, 30 million people were going to get shifted from uninsured to insured status. They talked a lot more about the Cornhuster deal. And, that, and then the other thing was um, we made the decision that it had to be paid for. And, and then we said to our stakeholders, hospitals, you know, if we're going to give you 30 million paying customers now, you have to, we reduced... Um, their reimbursement to Medicare. And that got translated into, we are cutting Medicare to pay for uh, the Affordable Care Act. Well, that was baloney. We were actually improving Medicare benefits. But yes, some of the reimbursement, because we were clawing back from hospitals, the fact that we were giving them 30 million more paying customers. And the other thing that drove us nuts was this whole issue of death panels. And what was the death panel? What was that? It was a provision. So if you all of a sudden, one of your loved ones got a um, diagnosis of cancer, the question was, what does that mean? How aggressively do you fight it? What, what are your chances of beating that cancer? How much is it gonna take? So we paid Medicare doctors more money 
so they could consult with their patients about what the right course of treatment was. And that was a Democrat and a Republican bill, Blumenauer and I forget the Republican. But that's what got translated into death panels. I mean, think about it. Would I accuse the Republican Party of creating a death panel? I mean, no, I mean, it's absurd. But those were some of the misleading statements that we had to deal with. And we passed it in early November uh, by a grand total of five votes or so. So, uh, so at this time, the work is proceeding in the Senate. And I want to ask uh, Kate to, to talk a little bit about the Senate Majority Leader, about Senator Reid, and how he built a Democratic coalition to pass the Senate bill um, going forward. So I'll start by saying Senator Reid suspected strongly that Republicans were not going to play ball on this bill from the beginning. He had worked with Senator McConnell. They were both whips together. They were both now leaders of their respective caucuses. Their stock in trade was counting votes and getting the votes for bills. That's what the whip does. And now they're both in the leader position. And he had a pretty good sense that McConnell was going to hold his caucus. He also knew that it was really important to the president that we do everything we can to try and attract bipartisan votes to this bill. And we were really looking at, given the makeup of the Democratic caucus at that time, which was a lot of Democrats from really red states, places you wouldn't conceive of having senator, Democratic senators from now, Alaska, Nebraska, Louisiana, Arkansas, I mean, North Dakota, South Dakota, the list goes on and on of these places where you would not expect to see Democrats elected. So he knew it was going to look an awful lot like what Mitt Romney had done in Massachusetts and an awful lot like what Bob Dole had proposed in the past. And he still thought this is Mitch McConnell's not going to let his caucus bleed votes on this issue. And he believed that, but he also knew how important it was to try and that it would be um, foolish to not attempt to have this be a bipartisan bill, but a bill of this magnitude. And so um, he watched as the administration proceeded. He watched as Senator Baucus famously negotiated for month after month after month with Senate finance Republicans, um, which was also a necessary process to get the votes in the Senate. We were not going to get uh, moderates from red states and people who deeply believed at that point still in compromise and working across the aisle to vote for a package without absolute certainty that there was no way to get Republican votes. So at the same time all of this was going on, Harry Reid still had to get six, a 60 vote majority in the Senate. When we started that Congress in January, we had 58 senators who caucused with Democrats, one of whom was an independent from Connecticut who had campaigned against President Obama and endorsed John McCain. And there was a lot of pressure to expel him from the caucus or strip him of his chairmanship. But Senator Reid, being a vote counter, recognized that, that was probably not a great long-term strategy and kept him in the fold. So that kept us at 58. And then in April, it became pretty clear to Senator Arlen Specter from Pennsylvania that he was going to face a very tough primary from, to remain uh, the Republican nominee for Senate. He'd voted with Democrats for the Recovery Act. Uh, he was under attack, and uh, Democrats made it comfortable for Arlen Specter to switch parties and become a Democrat, thus joining the fold over on our side of the aisle someone who had been a strong opponent of the Clinton efforts, had famously had the big poster of how complicated it was up in his conference room up until right after he switched parties. Um, <laughs> and then finally, this is where Hofstra comes in, sadly. Um, in uh, July, it, um, Senator Franken was declared the winner of the election in Minnesota, so my apologies about Norm Coleman, but that gave us our 60th vote. <laughs> Um, and so he knew that once we had 60, there was sort of a different dynamic. Um, and, and it gave us a little more running room. At the same time, he firmly believed we needed an escape valve um, in the form of reconciliation instructions, which would have allowed us to pass a bill, not the bill we wanted, not the bill that would have had all the important things for pre-existing conditions, lifetime and annual coverage limits, 
kids up to age 26, all these really key features of the ACA that are so important. He knew we wouldn't be able to do that, but we needed an escape valve. Um, and we needed to have some process available to us that we could pass something with a majority vote. And so he insisted, and the president insisted, and we worked with the House to make sure that we had reconciliation instructions in the Senate budget, um, in the House budget, for health reform. That would allow us to use a really arcane, weird budget procedure that we could do some things by 50 votes. It becomes critical later on in the process, um, but it was, it also, I, I believe, put a little bit of pressure on the people negotiating the bill because they knew something could happen without them. So even if you were in that 60 caucus, you knew something could happen without you because there was always the chance that we would do something with 51 votes. So I think that was really helpful. Um, and, and then the help committee, S Senator Kennedy was obviously very ill and Senator Dodd led the committee to mark up a bill and get it through and pass it before the August deadline that everyone had set. The Finance Committee negotiations took a lot longer and they came out with two bills that were very different but reflected the sort of two different wings of our caucus. The HELP Committee bill had a public option. It was more generous in its subsidies. The Finance Committee bill um, was, more, was less generous on subsidies, more focused on sort of delivery system reforms, less focused on workforce. And so Senator Reid was tasked with sort of merging those two bills together once it get, got out of the Finance Committee and getting it to the floor and passing it before um, the holidays. And so that we did that on Christmas Eve um, in the morning and got our 60 votes. Senator Reid actually was very tired and voted no originally <laughs> and then realized his mistake um, and voted yes. But uh, it, was, it was a long process. We had to juggle the interests of somebody like Bernie Sanders who wanted single payer um, against the interests of uh, Ben Nelson, who uh, was pretty uncomfortable with the whole idea. Um, so I think, you know, the, their famous, Wendell's mentioned the Cornhusker kickback. It was not the Cornhusker deal. It was fancier <laughs> than that. Um, and some of the other things that went in, and it was, there was a lot of end of, end of the um, process negotiating. We had to do a lot to maintain that coalition and what Ben Nelson actually wanted at the time was for the Medicaid expansion to be optional. And oddly, in a weird twist of history, that's what ended up happening. Unfortunately, we didn't have, when the Supreme Court made that decision, we had not planned for it. And so we didn't have any backstop for the people who were to lose coverage. But um, there was a lot of uh, negotiating and, go, and working with the caucus, but it was, it was sort of a necessary feature, I think, of the Senate that we have two different bills to start with because the committees were so very different, what, one being sort of more to the right, one being more to the left, and to show both sides that we were trying to get that through. And sadly, one of the biggest casualties of that whole process was the public option, which was a key feature for the president and for the House. And it became clear sort of at the very end, right before we were going to the floor, that Joe Lieberman was not gonna support a Medicare buy-in, and um, so the whole notion of a public option had to be dropped from the bill altogether. So we have the House bill passed, the Senate bill passes, it, I think it was on Christmas Eve of 2009. And then comes January 2010. January 2010, there's a special Senate election in Massachusetts, and it results in an unexpected Democratic loss of a filibuster-proof majority. Um, how did the White House and the House and the Senate leadership approach that situation and decide on a controversial strategy of having the House adopt the Senate bill and then, you, well, then the rest of the story, then having using the re reconciliation process to have the Senate pass the final part of the program? And, um, I really want to address that question to all of you, so I'm not sure who wants to answer that, who wants to jump in first about how that began. Well, I'll start. Began. Our Hofstra grad to your left there uh, was worried, and so we started the conference between the House and the Senate uh, well before that election that you're describing of, of Scott Brown in Massachusetts. And the president, I think it was the day after Christmas, I, I don't know, we started 
meeting, I remember Leader Reed was in Nevada still, and he was on speakerphone, which you never saw in the White House, but to start the conference, he was on speakerphone. Speaker Pelosi was there. Um, then we went into meetings, and Phil can describe this process, but the president presided over the conference between the two houses to get a bill ready to go to be passed. We were racing against time because by then, um, I don't think I knew, at least Phil may have known, but I did not know that we were going to not win that Senate seat, Senator Kennedy's seat, but, um, but we knew we, any way you look at this, it had been very tar hard. The longest um, markups in history for Senate finance and, and for the help committee, hundreds of Republican amendments, you know, this thing was uh, a lot of bricks in the in the truck, as they say, in the in the back, and we had to get moving, you know, quickly to keep our to keep our votes together. So that's the process that we that we started, and the president presided over it, and it went into, you know, morning hours. Phil, you yeah, should sure. Um... I could never decide in those first two years whether the president was the luckiest unlucky person I had ever met or the unluckiest lucky person I had ever met <laughs> because he's he's fighting all these currents to just do good things for the country and, and you have to battle it. And one of the criticisms of the president that I still can't square in my head is on one side people say he never did enough with Republicans. He never talked to them. And on the other side are people saying he could have done so much more if he just didn't talk to Republicans. He talked to them too much. So he gets it both ways. And as the head of legislative affairs, both can't be true, right? He started the whole process on health care saying, I'm going to do everything I can to make this bipartisan. But if we can't, then we're going to go ahead. I'm not going to let opposition keep us. So what people don't remember is very early in his presidency in the first two months, he brought Congress down to the White House, congressional 30 Democrats, 30 Republicans, outside groups to have a fiscal responsibility summit and a health care summit. He wanted it to be open. It was televised. He wanted to hear their thoughts. He wanted to accommodate their thoughts through the process. That's how we started. Nancy Ann alluded to the long markups in the Senate Finance Committee, the Senate Help Committee. It was the longest Senate floor debate since the civil rights legislation in the 1960s. It started two days after Thanksgiving and it went straight to Christmas Eve. The House had a similar process. The Energy and Commerce Committee, the, the chairman of that committee, who I knew very well, kept asking Republicans for their input. He wanted it to be bipartisan. That wasn't possible. In the Senate Finance Committee, Senator uh, Baucus convened three Democrats, three Republicans to have a group of six to have her out of compromise. And that stretched on um, for weeks and then months. And finally, uh, President Obama had them to the White House, I, I think it was August 6th or August 7th. And I was in that meeting, so I remember very clearly. He turned to Senator Grassley, who was the senior Republican on the Finance Committee, and said, if I make all the changes you're asking for, if I give you everything you want, will you be for the bill? And he said, no. So just think about that if you're trying to sell your car and you're negotiating for weeks with someone over the price and you finally say, OK, if I take your price, can we do this? And they say, no. What, what's going on here? Which relates to when we lost um, Massachusetts because there was only one avenue at that point to do, the, to do this, which was to use reconciliation. And reconciliation would mean that the House would have to pass the Senate bill and um, I remember this conversation very clearly with the president the day after, because we were talking about what our options were. And there's just one. And I said to him, this is going to be one of the most unpleasant experiences in your life, because the House is going to hate the idea that they have to pass the Senate bill. And they're going to fight us every step of the way. They're going to know they have to do it at the end to get the Affordable Care Act done. But it's going to be terrible. And shortly after that, I started receiving very unpleasant phone calls from people in the House saying, don't you dare think about doing this. On reconciliation, I just want to go back to one other point, why people are so important. Um, uh, Kate talked about the reconciliation instructions. In January of 2009, we made a decision on Ledge Affairs, uh, talking with the president, that we needed a reconciliation expert on our staff. In the Senate, 
the person who's probably most influential in the reconciliation process is the chairman of the Senate Budget Committee, Ken Conrad. So the person who became one of my deputies was his key advisor on reconciliation. So as we went through the process, she was not only bringing expertise to the White House, but could work with a senator from North Dakota who wasn't excited about a lot of the things we were doing. So once we sort of reached that decision, House passed the Senate bill, we'll do reconciliation, not to make all the changes that we wanted to do in the process Nancy Ann talked about in the cabinet room with the president, but as many as we could, then it was a process of getting the votes and a lot of unpleasant meetings. Just a quick question about that. Was the resistance from the House because of a substantive difference or was it really because of this tension and competition, you know, bicameralism between the House and Senate? <laughs> um, b before Wendell answers that, Wendell and I both have a view on that. I did want to mention, because I talked about the summits in the beginning, this is how committed the president was and it's important for this. Before we did reconciliation, he sat down with Nancy, Anna, Valerie, and myself and a few others and he said, I want to give it one more try. I want to bring all the Republicans down to the Blair House. I want to have it on TV. I want to hash out these things. I want to make sure before we move forward, we've exhausted every possibility to reach agreement. And he did that. And it ended up being about a six hour meeting and the Republicans again made it clear in that meeting that they, were, they weren't going to um, join us. The, the refrain Republicans are very good at in these uh, situations sometimes is we have to start over. Well, people have been trying to do health care for 100 years, right? We had passed a bill in the Senate. We had passed a bill in the House. We weren't going to start over in February. So my, quickly, my memory of it was we had these three days in the White House, as Nancy Ann was saying, and we got about 90% of the differences resolved between the House and the Senate. I remember one night Obama was furious at both the Senate and the House that we couldn't get it completely done. The idea was, could we actually pass it in both the House and the Senate before that Massachusetts special election? Well, we resolved that just the drafting time, getting CBO to score, it wasn't going to get done. And then I think it was probably my boss's, Nancy Pelosi's finest hour. I mean, she was hearing rumors from the White House uh, the chief of staff that they wanted something smaller and she thought history I mean again remember from Truman uh, to Clinton to others many people had tried to get um, universal coverage done and she recognized that this was the time and she had this quote she said we will go through the gate if the gate is closed we will go over the fence if the fence is too high we will pull bolt in if that doesn't work, we will parachute in. But we are going to get health care reform passed for the American people for their own personal health and economic security and for the important role that will play in reducing the deficit. So she, I think, initially resisted the idea, again, because of all these differences. Uh, but then she recognized that the only way this was going to happen was we had to pass the Senate bill lock, stock, and barrel. Couldn't make one change to it. And that's the bill that went to the White House first. And then we negotiated. Um, and again, reconciliation is not a very good device. I mean, you can only do quote unquote budgetary things. Um, so we negotiated the changes that the House wanted, a little more subsidy, closing the donut hole faster. I can't remember all the, all the details. And, um, and Mr. Reed got the senators to write a letter that never got released publicly, at least I think. And there was enough, um, again, trust between Harry Reid and Pelosi that when Harry Reid said he was going to pass that reconciliation bill, that we could let the Senate bill go to the White House, get signed into law, we would pass a reconciliation bill, and there were a couple changes that were made. Um, but that was the process that really resulted in the Affordable Care Act becoming the law of the land. But, and going back to your specific question, there are two things going on here. One is substantive, right? So people in the House really worked hard on their bill. I, I'm in the White, I was in the White House, so I'll be neutral on this, but the House members believed that their bill was superior to the Senate bill. There were a lot of similarities in it, but there were some key differences, so that's one. The second thing is Congress after Congress, when there were tough things going on, Senators come to House members and say, we, you got to take our bill. 
you know, we, we need 60. This is what it is. We can't get 60 unless you do our bill. We can't make changes. And House members who have been there for a while get fed up with that. And they say, enough of that. We, we want our stuff. So you have substance and built up frustration. Yeah. yeah. Um, Kane, I want to hear about that letter um, and a little bit about what was happening on the Senate side. Uh, the letter was uh, something Reid promised to the Speaker, that he would be sure we got at least 51 votes to pass the reconciliation bill. And so he had a letter, he kept it in his front office, and senators were supposed to come in and sign. And they, some of them came together because they were scared to come alone because they knew what was in this bill, but they didn't know exactly what was in the bill because we were still working on it. Um, and you can't modify with legislation something that is not already law. So the ACA had to be enacted first, and so the reconciliation package had to come second. And um, from the perspective of Harry Reid, that it made the bill much, much better. From the perspective of some of the moderates, it was more spending, even though it was paid for, and, and then some. It was um, the house the House people trying to make it more liberal, and there, you know, there's, a, there's distrust on both sides. So we had this letter, people signed it, Senator Reid went over to the caucus, to the Democratic caucus and spoke, he presented, went over there on his own and had the letter in his pocket and came back with the letter in his pocket. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> because I think that the speaker understood that if he said if he had 51, he had 51. Um, and that was something that was, um, great between the two of them as they really uh, understood each other. And so um, it was a letter that never really saw the light of day. Um, but we had 51 signatures on it. We had more than that. R.I.P. R.I.P. Leader Reed. Yeah. Um, he took so much heat for that, for uh, I, at least in the public forum, for the use of that process. It, was, it seemed to me that it was really centered on him. Um, what was that like? So the thing about Harry Reid is he's willing to take the heat. He was always willing to take it. He would, he was like a duck. Everything rolled off his back. I mean, he, he had a cat, a, like a litany of things in his head, I'm sure, and I know from some things. But he was um, unflustered by criticism and by people saying things. If he believed he was doing something right, I mean, this was a guy who grew up so poor, it's almost inconceivable to think about. His brother lie on a sofa with a broken leg and didn't get to see a doctor and had to be on that sofa till it healed. The first thing he did when he got a paycheck was buy his mom some teeth. I mean, he really believed in the importance of healthcare reform and making sure people could access healthcare. So whatever flack he took for it, he, I, I don't think he really cared. He, he was himself and he was just, um, as staff, it was really hard. I mean, we were so defensive of him, and he'd say, ah, who cares? But he was really um, capable of taking that heat and believed that was his role as the leader, was to be the one who took the hard shots and protected his caucus from getting criticized and believed that a lot of his members, including Ben Nelson, who um, famously had some of the deals in the bill, really had put their, um, their positions on the line. He knew they were not, they knew they were not coming back because this had been so vilified and they knew that they wouldn't win re-election and he had great respect for that. And so I think he was fine with it. <laughs> so there's one other key thing that kind of happened there at the very last um, moment. The Stupak language that I mentioned had gotten dropped from the Senate bill. And again, the, uh, and so to get, keep our pro-life members on, the president agreed to do an executive order and that enabled us, uh, again, it was one of the, big issues, um, again, the, when you have employer insurance, you, there's, the Hyde Amendment doesn't apply to employer-provided health care. It does apply to any spending. And, um, and so that's how we resolved that issue um, in, the, in the 11th hour. Um, I, I want to ask just one other um, question, and uh, uh, well, maybe two, and then we'll get to audience questions. Um, we've seen in the intervening years um, administrative, legislative, judicial efforts to undo the Affordable Care Act, and the states, and many of the states have failed to expand Medicaid and to set up exchanges. Um, what have been the most serious of these challenges, in your view? Um, 
I just want to go back for a second, though, to what Kate was saying about the process and also Wendell, uh, because it relates to what I said in the beginning about the people. Um, Leader Reed and his determination to get this done, Speaker Pelosi and her pole vaulting and parachuting, and the president and his determination. And during that time when we, when uh, uh, Senator Brown was elected and it looked like we might not be able to move forward, my team and I were just sitting there. So I said, all right, we're gonna work on a memo. We're, we're gonna look at every bill that's been introduced on health care for the last 10 years, Republican and Democrat, analyze it, see what it would have accomplished, how much it would cost. And we had a 75 page memo and the president dropped by my office one day and I was busily working on it. And he wanted to see it, of course, and he read it. And after it, we talked and he said, everything we worked on, a lot of it's in these Republican bills, Senator Burr's bill, Senator Coburn, the various ones that have been out there. Um, there's no reason, this is something we need to get done. And that determination that he had and that the two leaders had was just so important. So a lot of people say they get cynical about politics. I'm not cynical at all. Having seen the way members worked, you know, Wendell talked about the endless meetings in the House, going through aspects of this bill, trying to make sure it would achieve what they were trying to achieve for the American people. It doesn't, you can't be cynical after you've seen that kind of a process. Um, as far as the most dangerous challenges, look, we knew this is part of why the president and the leaders all wanted it to be bipartisan. We knew that uh, there would be risk. We did not know that the attorney general of Virginia would uh, file a lawsuit the second the president put his pen down after signing uh, the initial bill. Um, you know, it's been endless, en endless. I, I've lost track. I asked Wendell the other day, how many times has the House repealed it? 70, 60, something like that. Um, and yet no good ideas come up to really replace it. It's just, you know, and, and honestly, that does make me a little cynical at some point. What is that all about? What's, what, you know, is this on the level or is it not on the level? And then you look at um, uh, what's happened since, and I guess you're gonna get into that, but 40 million people gaining insurance, um, you know, Women can no longer be charged 27 times more as they could in some states at that time for insurance in the individual market. 133 million people with pre-existing conditions, many of whom thought they had a right to health insurance just because they'd been lucky enough to work in uh, for large employers, but they didn't know that if they ever were out in the individual market, they could be denied. Thank goodness we had the Affordable Care Act when the pandemic occurred. You know, what would we have done? Um, you, Phil talked about all the, or Wendell talked about all the young people who were able to stay in their parents' plans. Um, millions of people who've had ex access, women who've had access to preventive benefits uh, like contraception. Teen pregnancy rate is down. I have to think that has something to do with it. Uh, well woman benefits, lowered the rate of healthcare cost growth. Wendell, you referred to, and Kate, you both referred to we had to pay for it, but the president and your bosses wanted us not just to pay for it, but to lower the rate of health care cost growth, which we did. In fact, uh, the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, just pointed out that we overachieved, that federal um, health care spending was lower than they estimated by a trillion dollars over this 10 years from 2010 to 2020. Uh, we cut the health care cost growth rate in half. So all of those things uh, are the reasons why, Rosa, I think, uh, you know, I've said this before, and most of your students are too old to remember this, but Timex watches, um, you know, they take a licking, but they keep on ticking. And that's the Affordable Care Act now. That is, it is embedded now. People understand now because they saw it, it threatened to be taken away from them. They understand what it means. I'll say one more thing in the sense of, I think the scary thing was in the election of 2016, 2017, the Democrats did not control the White House or the House or the Senate. And, um, you know, Trump had uh, and the Republicans had um, said they were going to repeal the Affordable Care Act and replace it. Now, they never got to a replace. I mean, they never got to a replace. They did repeal. And I think it's an irony 
Uh, and I'd urge you all to look at the HBO documentary on Nancy Pelosi, because John McCain railed against the ACA. But at the end of the day, despite all the effort it takes to achieve a legislative victory, I mean, the, the, the learning curve, the grassroots efforts, et cetera, it was really John McCain, Barack Obama's 2008 uh, Republican uh, opponent, that preserved the legacy when he did this. And if he hadn't done that, the Senate would have passed the repeal, and I don't know where we would have been. But to some extent, I think it's just ironic that the person that ran against Barack Obama in 2008 really had a lot to do with preserving the ACA. Could I can yes. jump in? Because I want to do both Wendell and with Nancy Ann said. For Wendell, he's absolutely right with John McCain, and it was also Susan Collins and Lisa Murkowski. We had to get three three Republicans to do that. That was very important. And, and I want to go back, because I don't want to lose this in, in the session, because we're doing a lot of talking, so I'm going to be repetitive. But it goes back to hope and change when Nancy Ann was talking and talking about the metrics. Just think about it for a second. A law was passed in 2010 that has resulted in more than 40 million Americans getting coverage. 40 million people. That means lives are being saved. Law was passed that eliminated description for pre discrimination for pre-existing conditions. Law was passed that prohibits insurance companies from canceling policies when people get sick, which used to happen all the time. Insurance companies can no longer put lifetime limits on people. As Wendell pointed out, kids up to 26 can get coverage. The thing people forget is we closed the donut, so-called donut hole, which was a gap for senior citizens in the prescription drug in prescription drugs. That saved billions of dollars for senior citizens across the country. Nancy Ann pointed out women can no longer be denied coverage simply because they're women or be charged higher premiums. Uh, it used to be a non-smoking woman would pay a higher premium than a smoking man. Didn't make sense. One change that President Obama, Speaker Pelosi, Leader Reid, and all the congressional Democrats did that nobody ever talks about is prior to the Affordable Care Act, an insurance company could deny you coverage because you were a landscaper, a painter, a roofer. It's because you worked with your hands or your legs or your back. You did physical labor. Just because you did that, you could be canceled, not get insurance. Nancy Ann pointed out the deficit part of this. This is the biggest deficit reduction bill in the century, the biggest deficit reduction bill in decades. At the end of the day, it's not just going to save a trillion dollars off the deficit till 2035. It's not going to save two trillion dollars. It's going to be multiples of that, and there'll be new numbers coming out in the next month on that. But as Nancy Ann just said, and, and she, um, not Wendell and, and Kate, because they were in the White House, but Valerie was in those meetings, where the president would get so frustrated with the Congressional Budget Office. He said, I, I don't know, you know, why can't the, the numbers more reflect reality? It, it's a nice thing that the Congressional Budget Office just put out a paper last month that said, whoops, we were off by a trillion dollars in savings. We could have done a lot more in the bill if we had those trillion dollars in savings up front. But they get <laughs> right. But on top of all that, I'm sorry, but I know I'm like an infomercial. But this is hope, <laughs> but this is hope and change, right? Republicans said, and we all heard it over and over again, if you pass this bill, it's going to cost jobs all around the country. Since the bill passed in the Obama and the Biden administration, 28 million jobs were created. So you got a bill that created jobs, shaved off the deficit, got people life-saving care, and for some people that's still controversial. It doesn't make any sense. I'm going to ask those... I'm going to ask those who have questions um, to come down. There's a microphone here. And then as you're doing that, I wanted just to ask Kate if you had anything to add. Really, I wanted to shift more to, you know, what do you think are the, the, the best effects of the law? So I think the best effects are, are the insurance reforms, that people can get coverage, um, that there are no annual lifetime limits, that preventive coverage is, available without cost sharing um, that so many people have gained insurance and my favorite part when we passed it was the Medicaid expansion 
And so um, to your question about what the worst threat is, I think that that Supreme Court decision on the Medicaid expansion was the most sort of tragic piece of the whole thing. But if you take a look at what's happening recently, um, there are ballot initiatives to expand Medicaid, and Wendell's been talking about it quite a bit, um, so he might want to comment on it. But people are saying, we want this, even though they're legislators who they elected are voting against it in state houses across the country. It, it, again, it doesn't make any sense. Um, it is a no-brainer to take the Medicaid expansion, but I think that is one of the biggest gaps. The other piece that I think is the biggest gap and the, the sort of one of the saddest things that I think we have set ourselves back on is end-of-life care because that nonsense about death panels has certainly scared generations of lawmakers away from ever touching anything to do with end-of-life care, which is where we spend the most money and are the most irrational about how we spend it. And so I think that's one of the really unfortunate pieces of it all is that, that piece. Um, but another one more positive that I will say um, that I think actually now we need to build on and there where I think there actually may be some promises around the healthcare workforce. We do not have enough providers um, in really any field. We don't have providers all across the country in rural areas in particular, but even in places like Las Vegas where my boss was from. We don't have enough people to provide the care that people need. And there does seem to be this glimmer of bipartisan interest in that in Congress now. So that's my sort of hope going forward is that maybe we make some more progress around workforce and um, making sure we have the caregivers we need for the generation that's retiring now. Again, I want to uh, encourage you to come up and ask a question. We have just about five more minutes left. So um, now is the time to come down. Hello. Um, here's my, first of all, um, thank you as public servants. This was a great panel and someone who grew up without health insurance, like, you know, Obamacare, I think is truly transformative. Thank you. I, you know, I, I think it's to be lauded and it changes lives. So I'm gonna be very coarse. Um, I'm a political historian and I know you're policy people. In the late 50s, what liberals did is they switched to something called programmatic liberalism. You know, this is Hubert Humphrey and a bunch of eggheads from like the upper Midwest, especially Minnesota. And they're like, the, the new Democratic Party, the new liberalism, we appeal to voters based upon programs like Obamacare or maybe Joe Biden's uh, build back better or what passed the infrastructure plan. It seems to me that, and then we're baffled, right, when Obamacare is passed, 40 million American lives are transformed, okay, but there's no political reward. And it strikes me that perhaps there's a disconnect between what educated people think Americans vote on, meaning policy, right, and what voters actually vote on. And I'm not saying I like that world, but I'm wondering if that is the world, right? And I'll say this, the apocryphal story of the person who stood uh, at, at, at a vigil as FDR's train moved through his uh, train coming back from Georgia after he died, and the reporter asking him, why are you here? Did you know him? Meaning FDR. And he said, I didn't know him. He knew me, right? And I think I always thought that's the glue of the Roosevelt coalition. And I'm just curious, it's a coarse political question. Responses? Uh, do you want me to go? Well, I was just gonna say, President Obama was reelected. So <laughs> let's start there. But also I do think, oh, true, but I do think that people saw him fighting for them. And I think that's a part of why he won reelection. So. Presidents usually have a tough time in the midterm election, but I think there's something else, an answer to, to your question. And again, it goes back to hope and change. And it goes back to something that gets under my skin sometimes, is people say, well, he should have done more in the first two years. One of the problems in terms of telling a political story is he did so much in the first two years. It wasn't just saving the economy through stimulus. It wasn't just doing, in my view, one of the most successful laws in the last 100 years, the Affordable Care Act. He also, right off the bat, did the Lilly Ledbetter Act with Congress to make it harder to discriminate against women on pay. He did comprehensive financial reform. 
He got 899 nominees confirmed, including two Supreme Court justices. He did education reform, credit card reform, housing reform. He passed legislation with Congress on tobacco uh, so that kids wouldn't smoke. Those are all really big things. A big initiative for the First Lady was the Hunger Free Kids Act. That finally got done in, in, the, in the lame duck, but that was a great initiative by the First Lady. A big thing for the President was the New Star Treaty, where we had to get two-thirds of the Senate to vote for that. That got done. He, he championed, along with people in the House and Senate, don't ask, don't tell, and hate crimes legislation. The reason I go through all that, because it goes to your question, but that's a lot of stuff. And it's hard to craft a message when you're doing so much stuff in this political environment. But I'll take that, and I, I, w w I don't want to speak for him, but I'm sure President Obama would take it, because all those things change lives. And when you talk to health practitioners, the thing that's most important that they say is they see it every day with their patients. Don't ask, don't tell made a huge difference to people. Right? Hate crimes legislation makes a huge difference to people. Having two good Supreme Court justices makes it good to you. So that's not politics, but that matters. I'll just say one quick thing, and that is I grew up in the era of Walter Cronkite, um, and now, you know, democracy depends upon an informed electorate. And when you see um, Newsmax and Fox describe some current events, and then you see MSNBC and CNN, and it's like they're describing night and day. So I, I think, I don't know what we do about that, but I do really think the, one of the big differences here is that um, we've got such different views of what's happening, the current events going out every night, uh, and, and it, it makes it very hard um, for citizens to actually know what is happening. I, we can take one more question. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Hi. Um, when I was just a high schooler, ninth grade, that's when I started uh, following politics and what um, President Obama was doing. And the ACA was brand new to me, and I was looking at it from an outsider perspective because I couldn't do anything, I couldn't vote, but this meant the future of what was going to happen with my health care. And as I watched from the sidelines, I saw how much health care has changed and grown and how many people have access um, to all these affordable health care actions. And I even write, I write things down, sorry, for um, a difference in the health care delivered to disparities. Prior to the ACA, right, we have 42.2 Hispanic, of Hispanic populations, 24.4 of black populations, and 14.5 of white populations who were uninsured. From those 10 years, those numbers have gone down to 24.5 in Hispanics, 13.5 in black populations, and 8.2 in white population. And this is all thanks to the ACA. And then as a future healthcare leader, this means a lot because we are trying to deliver equitable healthcare to all these people in our societies. So the issue with the future of Gen Z and millennials is how do we get more people interested, right, into coming into policies and creating a better outcome for all the disparities out there? And again, thank you for everything. I think the first thing is we need to get you your own show on C. <laughs> I think that would help. You could be across networks. That's, ter that's, that's terrific. Uh, uh, it goes a little bit to what Wendell said. It's hard because people are bombarded with information, but it's doing exactly what you just did. It's doing your best to be informed. People in the country don't know that before the Affordable Care Act passed, uninsured rate was 18%. It's 8% now. And Texas has the highest uninsured rate in the country at 18%. If that just did what other states did and expanded Medicaid, we'd be way lower than 8%. But it's, it's, not, it's not allowing other people to say, none of this matters, nothing changes. This is hope and change, and everything you just talked about is hope and change. That's, that's exactly what I was going to say, and thank you so much for everything. Anybody else? Good